<laughs> but yeah, so I guess we can go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, Jalen, uh, as mentioned, I, I worked with uh, him over the summer. Super smart, has been working on bringing machine learning kind of into the central, like the core of database systems. Uh, one side of that being learned index structures, which is going to be talked about today. Uh, there's a whole other like half of Jalen's work that's on learned data layouts, which is also super interesting and smart, and I recommend you take a look at. The most recent paper on that, I think, is called Tsunami, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, yeah, take a look at Tsunami also uh, after the talk if you have interest in learned data layouts. But uh, yeah, take it away, Jalen. Uh, thanks, Kyle, for the introduction. And one sec, I'll just switch to laser pointer. So great. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And it's great to be here talking to you all. So today I'll present uh, learned index structures for dynamic and multidimensional data. So I might actually get to the tsunami work that Kyle just mentioned. But before I jump into the uh, projects themselves, I first want to talk a little bit about this broad research area of instance optimized database systems. So uh, most of my work falls under this research umbrella. And the same can be said for a lot of my you know, fellow students and postdocs in the DB group at MIT. So, you know, to explain what I mean by instance optimized database systems, I'll first give a bit of historical context. So most of you are probably familiar with the concept of auto-tuning. Essentially, um, a lot of modern systems, especially database systems, have a lot of internal parameters and knobs, which must be manually tuned by human experts like database admins in order for the database system to achieve good performance. Um, but tuning parameters is a very labor-intensive task, and it can be error-prone as well. So the idea of auto-tuning is to create algorithms and systems that can automatically tune these parameters without human assistance. So there's been a lot of research in this area over at least the past couple of decades. And now there are systems out there that can, for example, act as advisors for selecting indexes on tables, for creating materialized views, for picking you know, sort keys and prediction keys and many other things as well. And many of the techniques in this area have reached a state of maturity where they're actually being incorporated into widely used commercial systems. So for example, um, a few years ago, Microsoft SQL Server came out with this feature called automatic tuning which can fully automatically, without any human in the loop, um, add, like, uh, create and drop indexes from tables over time um, in response to the user workload. And more recently, um, Amazon Redshift, which is Amazon's data warehousing service, came out with this feature called automatic table optimization, which is able to, again, fully automatically decide which column to use when sorting a table, and also which column to use uh, when partitioning and distributing data across their multi-node system. So kind of one step beyond auto-tuning is what I'll call instance-optimized database components. So these are components like indexes or query optimizers that are able to self-adjust to the given data and workload that's being run on. So in other words, it's able to automatically optimize for the given use case or use instance. And at a high level, this might sound pretty similar to auto-tuning, but um, one kind of uh, subtle but fundamental difference is that auto-tuning typically tries to automatically do things that humans could already do manually. Whereas the idea behind these instance optimized database components is to go completely beyond what a human expert can do um, manually. Um, and kind of one big reason for that is that there's this core design principle behind a lot of these instance optimized components, which is to actually add more parameters to the system, not less. And that's because more parameters allows these components to be much more customizable to the particular use case. So for a given use case, these instance optimized components can perform much better than their more traditional counterparts, even when those traditional components are optimally tuned. Of course, the flip side is that if we have more, uh, more parameters, the design space is much larger and much more complex. So these components need uh, a way to efficiently navigate this larger design space. And many of them you end up using machine learning. So um, some examples of works in this area include learned indexes, which we'll talk about today, learned query optimization, learned scheduling, and many more. And even though this area is you know, still relatively new, there have been a lot of you know, research projects in this space. And some commercial systems have started experimenting with um, you know, integrating some of these techniques. So for example, recently, there was a team at Google that experimentally integrated learned indexes into Bigtable. And they showed some pretty promising early results. And I think there's also teams at Microsoft who have started looking into using learned cardinality estimation for their query optimization. So kind of the, the logical next step beyond instance optimized database components are you know, instance optimized database systems. And the idea is to actually take all these components and actually put them together into one end-to-end -end system that can self-adjust and self-optimize 
And the goal is to get as close as possible to the performance of a system that's custom built from scratch for a single use case. But of course, without the overhead of you know, manual design, architecting, and engineering. So uh, a few years ago, some of us at MIT um, published this paper at CIDR, which presented this vision of a learned database system called SageDB. And more recently, over around like the, the past half year or so, a team of us have actually started trying to build out SageDB for real. So those of you who are kind of familiar with some of the stuff I presented on the slide might be more used to hearing the phrase learned systems or ML enhanced systems or ML for systems. But you'll notice that on the slide, I've kind of purposely used the phrase instance optimized instead. And I'm doing that on purpose because I think this phrase is simply you know, better and more accurate. That's for a couple of different reasons. So first of all, instance optimized systems are simply a broader and more inclusive class of systems than ML for systems. And that's because machine learning is simply one method of, of, uh, of doing optimization, but it's certainly not the only method. And in many cases, it's not even the best method. So for example, we could instead use more traditional optimization methods like linear programming or even heuristics. And the best method really depends on the situation. And another reason why I like this phrase, instance optimized, is because it's more focused on the goal of these systems. The goal being to self-adjust to a particular use case. Whereas ML is simply one method for achieving that goal. But again, it's not the only method, nor is it always the best method. So I and others at MIT and other colleagues elsewhere have recently started making a conscious effort to start referring to our research as instance optimized systems or components. And over the past few years, there's been you know, a lot of work on instance optimized database components spanning a wide range of topics from indexes to bloom filters to core database algorithms to storage layouts and query optimization, scheduling, cache policies. And I'm sure there are other topics that I didn't include on this slide either. Um, and the papers on the slide are just a sample of the recent papers that I know about. And I'm sure there's a lot more that I'm missing as well. But in any case, this shows that there's a lot of excitement in this area and also a lot of work being done in this area. And today, I'll describe um, some work on learned indexes uh, in particular. So to give the appropriate context for learned indexes, I'll first describe a more traditional non-learned index. And probably the most well-known traditional index is the B plus tree. So I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with this topic, so I'll just give some brief highlights. Um, so a B plus tree is an index over sorted data that supports what I'll call OLTP style mixed workloads. That means it supports a mix of both read operations like point lookups and short range queries, as well as write operations like inserts, updates, and deletes. And uh, the advantages of the B plus tree include the fact that it's very general purpose. It can work on essentially any data type in a variety of settings. It has very nice properties in, ter in terms of space usage and the performance of its read and write operations. And it's been developed and tuned over many decades. Um, so it's widely used and there are various optimizations for it. But one downside to the B plus tree is that it doesn't really exploit knowledge of the data that it's indexing. And this can really leave performance on the table. And to explain what I mean by that, I'll use um, an example. So let's say we have this table in our database. So this table contains information about orders made by customers you know, from some company. So the first column is the ID of the order. The second column is the date uh, that the order went out. Then there's the name of the person who made the order, et cetera. So let's say we want to build an index over this first ID column. Now, probably the default thing that you know, a DBA would do is to create a B plus tree over this column. But the question is, can we do better than a B plus tree by exploiting the data distribution? Um, so if we kind of inspect the data in this column, one thing we observe very quickly is that the data is essentially consecutive integers starting from 1,000. So it's very likely that this ID column um, is you know, auto-generated and auto-incrementing. So we can use this observation to help us very efficiently perform lookups by ID. So more specifically, if we want, if given an ID, we want to know, you know which row that ID can be found in, we can simply look in row number ID minus 1,000. So for example, if we're looking for ID 1,100, we look in the 100th row, assuming zero indexing. And this you know, very simple distribution aware indexing method is not only accurate, meaning it finds the correct row, it's also very performant. So in, in particular, you know, to perform the lookup, we only need to do one addition, specifically ID plus negative 1,000. And to store this index, we only need to store one integer, namely negative 1,000. Um, and so we can compare this to what would happen if we had created a B plus tree over this column. Um, so assuming this table is you know, quite large, 
doing a lookup on the B plus tree probably incurs around one IO when traversing on the tree. And storage cost also scales with the size of the data. So on this very simple example, in terms of lookup performance and storage, our very simple distribution aware indexing method wins out by quite a lot. Now, of course, you know, data doesn't really look this clean in practice. We usually don't have consecutive integers. So what happens on you know, more realistic data? So as another example, we can consider the date column. So the date column is still sorted, but you know, some dates occur once, some dates occur more than once, some dates occur not at all. So now if you examine the distribution of this date column, um, and here at the bottom, I've just copied the date column, except now it's horizontal. So it looks like a sorted array of dates. The frequency distribution is very non-uniform because after all, you know, different dates have different amount of orders, maybe due to you know, monthly or weekly or seasonal patterns. And the cumulative distribution function or CDF for this data is also very nonlinear. Now, assuming we had an accurate representation or an accurate model of the CDF, such that for a given date, like November 27th, 2017, we could uh, you know, accurately recover the CDF of that date over this data. Um, assuming we had this accurate representation of the CDF, if we want to look up that date in this sorted array, meaning find the position of this date in the sorted array of data, what we can do is multiply the CDF by n, which is the total number of values or, or total number of positions in this array, which will accurately give us you know, the position of that date in this sorted array of dates. So the whole takeaway behind these couple examples is that if we have an accurate representation of the CDF or an accurate model of the CDF, then we can very efficiently perform lookups without having to build the whole classic B plus tree structure over this data. And that's essentially the whole idea behind learned indexes. We assume we have some sort of data, which here I've drawn in green, and we assume we want to perform a lookup of where a key exists in this sorted array. And to do that, we feed the key into some CDF model, which will predict the key's position in the sorted array. And now in most cases, our CDF model is not 100% accurate, so the predicted position might be slightly off from the true position. So to correct for the model error, um, we do some local search around the predicted position. And by default, it's done using binary search. So now one big question is, what exactly does this CDF model look like? So in concept, you know, this model can use any modeling techniques, ranging from something as uh, complex as a neural network to something as simple as a linear regression. But in general, we want the CDF model to have three uh, properties. In particular, we want it to be fast to evaluate. We want it to be um, relatively compact and also accurate. So the initial proposal for learning indexes, or the initial paper that came out in 2018, described a CDF model called a recursive model index, or RMI for short. And an RMI is essentially just a hierarchy of lightweight models. So I've drawn an example RMI here above, which has two stages or two levels, though in general, RMIs can have more than just two levels. And this particular RMI in stage one has one linear regression model, and in stage two has n cubic polynomial models. But again, in concept, these can be any lightweight models. They don't have to be linear or cubic. So to perform, uh, to use the CDF model or this RMI to uh, predict where a key is located in the array, we feed the key into the stage one linear model. That will select one of the stage two cubic models. We then feed the, the key into the stage two cubic model, which will then actually predict a position in the sorted array. Um, and so this RMI is, uh, because it's composed of these you know, simple lightweight models, it's typically fast to evaluate, and it's also relatively compact. But by combining like kind of the, uh, the expertise of all these models together in one hierarchy, it's also fairly accurate. So this was the initial uh, proposal for a learned index. And since then, there have been various other proposals and other papers for different learned index designs and different CDF models. And there is a paper that's going to come out at the LDB later this year that actually benchmarks a lot of these you know, learned index proposals against more traditional methods. So in this plot, we have index size on the x-axis, and then the lookup time of that index on the y-axis. So we want to be closer to the bottom left corner. And you'll see that the, the three learned indexes that are benchmarked here, which are shown using circular markers, are closer to the bottom left corner compared to more traditional methods like the, the B-tree, which is shown in purple. And the takeaway from this, this plot is actually, it's not so much that you know, learned indexes can shave a couple hundred nanoseconds off lookup time. The, the key takeaway is actually more that when achieving the same lookup time, learned indexes are much more compact than traditional indexes. And that's important in practice because, for example, it can save an I.O. when doing traversal down the index, or it can relieve memory pressure from other parts of the system. 
So this benchmark shows some nice empirical results of learned indexes. And um, last year at ICML, there was this paper that actually did some theoretical analysis. And it showed that given certain assumptions, we can actually prove that learned indexes are more space efficient than traditional indexes like a, like a B tree. So clearly, learned indexes, uh, you know, they, they seem pretty promising in terms of you know, reducing index size and reducing lookup time. But there are some limitations. So in particular, this kind of first wave of learned index designs generally lacks support for the full B plus tree functionality, meaning they could support read operations like lookups, but they didn't really support dynamic data, meaning they couldn't do inserts, updates, or deletes. They didn't really support concurrency. They were designed for in-memory data, so they didn't really support uh, persistence. And they also didn't really support multidimensional data, which is a big use case in analytics. So today I'm going to present two projects that kind of try to address these limitations. Um, in particular, I'm presenting two learned indexes that can handle dynamic data and also multidimensional data. Um, so before I go on, are there any questions so far? Great. Then for the rest of this talk, I'll focus most of the time on describing our learn index for dynamic data, which is called Alex. Um, and this was initially published in Sigma last year. So Alex is a project that uh, was started way back in 2018 when I was an intern at Microsoft Research. And here on this slide, I'm just showing the list of authors from our you know, initial Sigma paper. But even after that Sigma publication, we've continued working on Alex and we've been trying to extend it um, you know, uh, beyond its initial design. And as part of that effort, we have a bunch of new collaborators um, that we've added to the team, including Kyle, who was interning with us or with MSR last summer. So the goal of Alex is to be one index structure that kind of combines the best qualities of both the classic B plus tree, as well as the initially proposed learn index based on this you know, RMI recursive model index structure. So everything in this table is supposed to be relative. So in terms of lookup time, uh, we hope that Alex will achieve the same fast lookup times, if not faster lookup times, than the initially proposed RMI based learn index. We want Alex to have the same fast-ish insert times as a B plus tree, and we also want Alex to be uh, relatively compact in, in terms of index size, similar to the learned index. Question? Yes. So I'm I'm um, um, puzzled by why you you call the B plus tree slow for lookup and fast for insert time. I would have characterized this uh, the opposite way. Can right. So yeah, that's a really good point. I guess everything in this in this table should be you know, seen relatively by row. So we're saying that you know, just for lookup time, B tree is slower than the learn index. But uh, yeah, between for within a column, yeah, it might not make as much sense. Thanks. Great, so these are the goals of Alex. And now in terms of the high level design, which I'll go into more detail about in the following slides, um, Alex has a dynamic tree structure, very much like a B plus tree. So what that means is, as you can see in this diagram of Alex on the right, um, Alex is composed of a bunch of nodes that are organized roughly in a tree structure. And in particular, the nodes can either be internal nodes, which are shown as rectangles, uh, you know, like, like up here, or data nodes, which are shown as circles. Um, and we call this a dynamic tree structure because in Alex, nodes can split and merge, just like in a B plus tree. And then each node contains a linear regression model. So that's what these you know, boxes with M's inside them represent, their models. And the purpose of these models varies depending on the node type. So at internal nodes, the purpose of the model is to select a node at the next level. So for example, in this internal node at the root, um, you know, we have an array of pointers and each pointer points to some node at the next level. Um, and so in some sense, the internal nodes of Alex are very similar to the internal nodes of a B plus tree. With the difference being that Alex internal nodes um, only contain an array of pointers. They don't contain any keys. Um, and of course, they also contain a model, unlike a B plus tree. Now, data nodes in Alex are kind of analogous to leaf nodes in the B plus tree in the sense that data nodes actually contain the data in these you know, sorted arrays, uh, which are actually called gapped arrays. And I'll explain that um, in the following slides. Um, so the purpose of models in Alex data nodes is to actually predict the position of a desired key in the sorted array of data that's sitting in that data node. So we call this overall Alex structure an adaptive RMI. That's because similar to the original recursive model index from the original uh, learned index, we have a hierarchy of very lightweight linear regression models. 
but it's also adaptive in the sense that you know the structure is dynamic, nodes can split and merge, um, and I'll describe this you know more later. So in terms of core operations, Alex performs a lookup by first using the RMI or the adaptive RMI to predict the location of a key in a data node. Meaning we, we start at the root node, we feed our desired key into the model, the model will select one of the nodes at the next level. And then we do that recursively down the tree until we reach a data node. Then at the data node, we use the data nodes model uh, to predict the key's position within the sorted uh, data array. Now, the model is probably not 100% accurate, so the predicted position you know, you know, might not actually be the real position of the key. So to correct for that model error, we do some local search to find the true position of the key. And uh, in particular, we use exponential search, and I'll describe why we do that later in the slides. Hey, so um, John, just one quick question, um, just about that point about doing the exponential uh, search to take care of um, you know, uh, model errors. You're kind of yeah. making a, a, you have a, a model of model errors that, that that's very uh, kind of like around local perturbations. Do you find that to always be empirically the case? Do you ever have kind of, you know, model predictions here that are, you know, very significantly off beyond the the kind of default range that you expect? Yeah, that's a great point. So we actually have you know embedded into the design certain techniques for reducing the model error. Um, one of them I'll describe later. And another of them is simply the fact that since we're already dividing the data into data nodes, you know, if a data node is only length 1000, then the error- Yeah, so you have that as an upper bound. Yeah, sure. That's an upper bound. But one thing actually to note about exponential search is we don't necessarily need to know the bound up front since we simply start from the predicted position and gradually you know, increase the search range until we get the right key. Cool, no, uh, th thanks for the very helpful answer. And I assume that uh, that this is, I mean, this is baked into the empirical results that talk about, you know, average time anyway for those, say those benchmarking results, like how often uh, it's uh, outside a certain bound. So I guess it, it seems like it's not that big of an issue empirically also. Right. I guess not for Alex, but for the other index structures. Oh, right. And the benchmark that I showed earlier, um, in some sense, right, the CDF models are built in a way that, you know, tries to minimize the error. Um, there is a trade-off though, because we can create a simpler CDF model that is faster to evaluate, but maybe it's less accurate. And then we just pay a bit more cost in terms of the final search to, to correct for the, the model error. Um, but yes, empirically, yeah, yeah. it all kind of works out. So also another question, uh, could you maybe clarify here, given that Alex's design at a high level is pretty much like in a tree-based index structure, except the nodes are kind of indexes, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, are these um, uh, models. So can you say a few words about like, how does that, if I compare this to a standard B, B plus tree in terms of like the fan out of the nodes or the number of the nodes or the size of each node, can you uh, help us kind of make that comparison? Yeah, that's a great point. So you'll probably get more clarity in the following slides, but I, I'll say now that um, in general, the fan out is much larger and the nodes themselves are on average much larger. Um, and what that means as a result is that the structure itself is usually more compact because if nodes are larger, we have fewer nodes overall. And though they're like the, the depth of the tree is also usually lower um, and traversal time is also usually lower. So it all kind of works out. And there's a reason why our data nodes end up being quite large. Well, in some cases quite large and I'll get to that in the following slides. Okay, that sounds good. Great, so I just explained how to perform a lookup on Alex. Now to do an insert um, of a new key value pair, we simply first do a lookup to find the correct insert position of that new data in order to you know, maintain sorted order. And then we just physically insert that new key value pair, which might require shifting uh, some existing data in order to make room for the new data within the data node. And uh, deletes and updates can be performed pretty similarly to an insert. Right, so in the design that I'm describing today, we assume that data is in memory, that the keys have numeric data types, or at least fixed length data types, and that uh, the system is single threaded. And there is, you know, so this is the design in our initial Sigma paper, but there is already research underway that seeks to kind of address some of these constraints. So at a high level, kind of, you know, as Magda also pointed out, this kind of looks just like a B plus tree except that there's you know, models at every node. 
But actually under the hood, there are some pretty subtle but important design points that uh, help Alex achieve its performance goals. So in particular, uh, Alex is kind of built on four core ideas, namely the gapped array, model-based inserts, exponential search, and an adaptive tree structure. And these core ideas all combine to help Alex achieve faster reads, faster writes, adaptiveness, and also a more compact uh, index size. So I'll explain all these core ideas in order. So the question we're trying to address with our gapped array is, you know, how should data actually, actually be stored, you know, in sorted order within data nodes? And there's a few different choices here. So we could just store data in a dense array, but uh, this runs into problems when we want to insert new data. So in particular, let's say we want to insert the new data item with value zero into this dense array. We would essentially need to you know, allocate a new dense array with at least one more slot, copy over all of the old data, and then insert the new data item. And this is obviously you know, quite inefficient, and in particular has O of n insertion time, where n is the size of just this one dense array. Now, B plus trees do slightly better. So B plus tree nodes usually leave free space at the end of the node to absorb inserts. So now if we want to insert the same data item with value zero, then we can simply shift over some of the existing data to make room for the new data. Um, and this avoids having to allocate a new node. Um, but nonetheless, because we're shifting over um, pretty much you know, most of the data in the node, insertion time into a B plus tree node is still O of n, where again, n is just the size of this one B plus tree node. So in Alex, what we do is we, we take the B plus tree idea of having free space, but instead of putting that free space at the end of the node, we kind of disperse it throughout the node. Um, and that results in what looks like gaps throughout the array, and therefore we call this structure a gapped array. And now if we want to insert a new data el element, like the value of zero, we can shift over only a small number of existing elements to make room um, uh, for the new element. So as it turns out, you know, given some assumptions, insertion into a gapped array should take O of log n time with high probability. So kind of the takeaway here is that in Alex, we store data in data nodes using gapped arrays because gapped arrays achieve inserts using fewer shifts, which leads to faster writes. Um, and this is important in practice because in Alex, um, as I mentioned a, a little bit ago, data nodes can grow quite large. So this difference in insertion time can actually be quite important in practice. Um, now, one final detail about the gapped array is that these gaps in the array, they're not actually truly empty. We actually fill them with duplicate values of the closest existing key to the right. And then any gaps at the very end of the array are filled with some special sentinel value, which I have here denoted S. And this is all for the purpose of just having more efficient search over the array. So now the second core idea is model-based inserts. And the question we're trying to address here is, you know, we've determined we're storing data in gapped arrays, but where exactly should we put those gaps in the gapped array? So the simplest approach is to just distribute them uniformly. But it turns out we can actually do better. So as an example, let's take the same gapped array from the previous slide. Um, and let's assume in this toy example that the model in that data node looks like this, where the arrows depict where the model thinks the key is located in the gapped array. So for example, the model thinks that you know, the key with value one is located in this position. It thinks that the key with value two is located in this position. And it's clear that this model is not super accurate. So the kind of core idea behind model-based inserts is that you know, we have some flexibility in terms of where we put the gaps. And therefore, we also have some flexibility in terms of where we put the data. So we're going to put the data where the model thinks it goes. Uh, and that's what we mean by model-based inserts. So as an example, let's take out all the data from this array and reload them using model-based inserts. So the model thinks that the key with value one goes in this position, so we put it there. And the model thinks that the key with value two goes in this position, so we put that there, and so on and so forth. Um, and sometimes the model think that, might think that two different keys go in the same location, which is physically impossible, as is the case for like four and five here. So in that case, we simply put you know, the second or the other key um, in the closest open position to the right. So, after we do model-based inserts, kind of by construction, the model is now much more accurate than before. And now if we want to insert new data, we also can use the model to kind of guide where to put the data you know, in this gapped array. So, so here's what you know, that means in practice. So here we insert 100 million keys into both the original RMI-based learn index, as well as into Alex. And again, only Alex is using model-based inserts here. And I'm showing a histogram of the prediction error for each of the 100 million keys, 
where prediction error means the distance between the predicted position in the array and the true position of the key in the array. So you'll see that the learn index has kind of mode error around um, 8 to 16, number of positions, and it also has kind of a long tail of errors to the right. Whereas Alex, which uses model-based inserts, um, typically has very low prediction error, usually only 0 or 1 or 2. And so the takeaway here is that uh, since Alex uses model-based inserts, it's able to achieve much lower prediction error in its data nodes, which leads to faster reads because we spend much less time uh, correcting for that prediction error. So hold on, I have a question about this experiment. Yes. So uh, because it's, I mean, to build the model, you need to have some data, right? Yes. To figure out where it goes. Um, but then you're inserting following the model. So do, do you start with like a partially filled data sets, you learn the model, and then you add more data values to it to actually measure these uh, prediction errors? Or how was like, how did you run this experiment exactly? Right. So. We kind of assume that we're, you know, bulk loading a an Alex structure, which also means bulk loading all its data nodes. So when we know we want to insert a set of keys into a data node, we first train the model um, over that set of keys, assuming a dense array, and then we kind of scale it a little bit to account for the fact that we actually have free space or gaps interspersed throughout the array. Um, so like, you know, if we know if we're going to give, you know, forty gaps per every one hundred true keys. Then we train the model on the dense array and then multiply you know, the slope and intercept by 1.4. And then we actually insert according to the scaled model. And then this particular benchmark is measuring right errors in whatever the data format is. So in the learn index, it's actually a dense array. Um, so in some sense, the learn index actually has an advantage there because like the maximum possible error is smaller because it doesn't have all these gaps. In Alex, we're measuring the prediction error in terms of, you know, physically how many positions in the gap array off is the prediction from the true location. Oh, I see. But, uh, but what's interesting is that in the learned index, you have a dense array, and then you learn the positions and where they are. In Alex, mm -hmm. you have a dense array, you learn the position, you scale it, and then you reinsert everything in a way that minimizes errors. So, yeah. right. So then you'd expect that the errors will be smaller because you had an extra chance oh. to reorganize the data based on what the model had actually learned. Yes, exactly. Uh, we train the model first, um, and then we insert based on the model. Uh, I should note, though, that you know, I say we train assuming a dense array. This is like we don't have to physically place them in a dense array. We can like kind of implicitly say like, oh, this key will go in you know position zero, and so we add that to our training set for the linear regression, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's done all logically. So in terms of performance, it doesn't have like a huge amount of overhead. Right, so that is model-based inserts. And this actually kind of directly leads into our third core idea, which is exponential search. So recall that in the initial you know, learned index proposal you know, from the initial paper back in 2018, um, the default search method is binary search or correcting for errors. And one question is, can we do better than binary search? And as you might imagine from the title of the slide, the answer is yes. So here's a micro benchmark where we compare the performance of binary search with exponential search. So on the x-axis, we are artificially varying the error of uh, model predictions. Again, error is measured in terms of you know, number of positions from the predicted to the actual position. And on the y-axis, we are showing search time. That means the time it takes to you know, use the search method to correct for the model error. So you'll notice that binary search essentially has the same search time regardless of error size. And that's because binary search always has to kind of start from the worst case error bounds uh, to do its search. Whereas exponential search starts from the predicted position and only gradually increases its search bounds um, over time until it reaches the, uh, the, the desired key. So that's why the search time of exponential search scales with the error size. And now the point is, since we use model-based inserts, we can you know, more or less assume that model errors will be relatively low. So we should generally be in this regime of the plot and therefore, we'll know that exponential search should be faster than binary search. So in Alex, we use exponential search by default. So I have another question. Uh, the other question is, so if uh, you basically start off by kind of creating some gap in the data node, so that allows you to kind of place everything. But if you have some kind of, let's say those are like cells, over time, as people make transactions, the number of data items grow. So eventually, you will fill in those gaps. So what happened at that time in your system? Right, that's a great point. So certainly, if the data node becomes full, 
then um, actually I'll explain on the next slide, we have to start modifying the tree structure by like splitting that node into two separate data nodes. Okay. Or expanding the size of the gap array. Before we go there, uh, another quick question. I'm confused when the error size is small, mm -hmm. then a binary search should also be good unless you, is it a, a, a traditional binary search or does it start from the predicted position uh, in, the, in the array? Right, so the setup of this experiment is um, we always run binary search with a bound of 100K. So the initial min and max are 1,000 1, positions apart. And we, we set up this experiment in this way because we're simulating the scenario in which we have a data node and the maximum prediction error um, in this data node is say like 1,000. Therefore, if we always want to use binary search, then no matter what prediction uh, for which key we use, we always have to assume the worst case, which is that the error might be a thousand. So the binary search has to start with a, like a search bound of a thousand. Uh, yeah, it seems to me this is a very, very naive baseline. So you need to make an effort to actually think about doing this. I would simply start, you know, from the current position and, and uh, increase. Uh, I mean, exponential search seems more baseline than the binary search. That's my, uh, my intuition here. I see, interesting. So to clarify, is your proposal that, because when you said that we should you know, try a method where we start from the predicted position and kind of you know, search outwards from that predicted position, um, that's essentially what we're doing with the exponential search that we're describing here. Right, exactly. Uh, it's just, I'm, I'm not convinced that the binary, binary search would be like the baseline. Uh, if somebody really implemented this, um, okay, too bad. Uh, but uh, uh, the exponential search is very well known. So, for example, in leapfrog, leap, leap, leapfrog, uh, leapfrog intersection of, of two, two sorted sets, uh, exponential search is a, is a norm. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm picking too much on this slide, but um, I, I find it hard to believe that somebody would implement binary search in this context. Yeah, maybe it's just my. Oh, for sure. Impression. I think what, what I'm saying here is that. Um, the, we're comparing against the initial learn index design. And what they did there is they assumed for every data node, you kind of measure the worst case error. And so now whenever you predict a position, you, say, you assume the worst case error and do binary search. And we're exactly. arguing with Alex that that is a bad approach and that you should rather do exponential search. So they actually did this. <laughs> That's interesting. Yes, uh, that was yeah, the then, then I think it's justified to, to compare. Right, right. We're not saying necessarily that um, Right, that binary search, you know, should be used or, or whatever. We're just saying, like, yeah, you know, exponential search is better than just a naive binary search, assuming worst case bounds. Okay, thanks. Yep. I'm assuming that for exponential search, you're also taking into account the direction in which you have to go. Right. Uh, exactly. So what we do is we predict a position. If the key at that position is less than our desired key, we go towards you know the right. If it's greater right. than our desired key, we go just go towards the left. Yeah. Great, so the, the first three core ideas I described all kind of deal with what happens inside a data node, meaning like, you know, how do we store data inside a data node and also how do we do search inside a data node. But as Magda pointed out, inevitably these data nodes can become full due to inserts. And also the models within the data nodes can become inaccurate, also probably due to inserts. And so at that point, we need a way to modify Alex's tree structure itself. So as I kind of mentioned a few slides ago, Alex has this dynamic and flexible tree structure. And in particular, um, like a B plus tree, Alex can split data nodes sideways. So in this diagram, we have a data node A, say it's full. So we split into two halves, A and A prime. And just like a B plus tree, this split can propagate all the way up to the root. Excuse me. Now, unlike a B plus tree, um, nodes in Alex also have the ability to split downwards. So on the right, we again have you know, a full data node A, and we split it into A and A prime, but they're both the children of a new inner node. And then in Alex, we also have the ability to not split a node and instead to expand a node. Um, so in the example down here, we see that the, the gapped array you know, is full, it's totally black. So what we can do is allocate a new larger gapped array, copy over all the old data from the old gapped array into the new gapped array and place the new gapped array into the same data node. So this doesn't require you know, logically splitting the data node at all. Um, and if we want, we can actually also copy over the same model. So the implication of this is actually that, um, you know, 
data nodes in Alex are variable sized. So this is in contrast to you know, the fixed size pages of B plus trees. And actually data nodes in Alex can grow quite large you know, as long as the, the model stays accurate. So the inverse of all these operations is also possible, meaning we can merge nodes and we can contract nodes. So I've just presented a whole bunch of different mechanisms for you know, modifying Alex's tree structures. So now the question is, which mechanism do we choose and when do we apply it? So a B plus tree has you know, a very simple set of fixed rules for when to merge and when to split nodes. But in Alex, we don't really want to rely on a heuristic set of fixed rules. So instead what we do is we make all decisions about structural modification of the tree with the sole purpose of maximizing performance. So what that means concretely is that we have a very simple linear cost model of given a, an Alex um, a tree structure, we can predict the average query runtime on that structure. And here a query means either a point lookup or an insert. So now whenever it comes time to you know, modify the structure of the tree, maybe because the data node is full, Alex will automatically apply the mechanism that will maximize the performance or the predicted performance of the resulting tree. So I have a question before you move on. Um, one of the reasons why it's useful to have uh, data nodes and all kinds of nodes be the same size uh, is because it kind of makes it easier to manage the buffer pool, right? Because all the elements that are cached in the buffer pool are going to be the same, uh, same size. Uh, so here, if you're going to have data nodes of different sizes, how does that interact with the buffer pool? Yeah, that's a great point. So in this initial design, we're focusing on data that's in memory. So in some sense, we kind of explained it away. But we do have current work or you know, with collaborators who are trying to extend this to persistence. And there's a couple different you know, potential ideas there. One is to use some like more byte addressable you know, kind of uh, persistence like persistent memory. Um, another is um, to, to somehow deal with variable size pages in the buffer pool. And I think there's been some work from, uh, you know, I think TUM with their Umbra system and Lean Store where they're actually designing buffer pools that can kind of um, efficiently you know, handle variable size pages. So those are some potential ideas. Sure. And then I'm also kind of wondering because the other, uh, just kind of to understand how the two designs interact, because you could imagine kind of pushing uh, B plus trees in the kind of direction of having uh, variable size pages or uh, in the direction of doing some kind of lossy compression instead of making sure that kind of all the keys, you know, point uh, just very accurately. And I'm also kind of wondering what would it mean if we apply these kinds of lossy compression mechanisms to try to also reduce the size of the data structure versus using these uh, model-based indexing? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so we didn't really explore that too much in this work. So I, I, uh, I'm not super qualified, I think, to give a concrete answer, but I think we can apply those techniques in the same way that they can be applied to B plus trees in the sense that we're also storing keys and you know, I guess, pointers may be less so compressible, but still storing like keys and values. And so the same compression techniques applied to B plus trees, hopefully can also carry over to this work. Um, though again, I'm not super familiar with uh, the, the given techniques, so I don't know, you know if they would be more or less effective here. Right, we're kind of also kind of going in the other direction, right? If I take a, some kind of B plus tree and then I start to say that it's okay to approximate and do some searching at the bottom, uh, therefore I don't have to be completely accurate, therefore I can reduce the size of the B plus tree because I can have these types of approximations. Um, it seems like kind of these two designs start from different points, right? And could probably find each other somewhere in the middle. Yeah, uh, so I there's two things I'll say to that. So first of all, there are you know, other proposals, you know, other papers and, and whatnot that try to start from the B plus tree and add models you know, incrementally mm -hmm. to the B plus tree design. And actually in our evaluation, we you know, evaluated against kind of you know, a simple version of that where we put a linear regression model in every node of the B plus tree and mm -hmm. use that model to help guide search. So, so it's certainly possible, it's a viable solution. The other thing I'll say though, is that um, it, it comes down to, I think, just terminology in a sense, because like what is a B plus tree? I think we define, or uh, like us in this work would define B plus trees as structures that use comparisons to traverse down the tree. Like you compare all the boundary keys and based on that, you select a pointer um, to the following mm -hmm. level. If we start to put models in there, then in some sense it is kind of a learn index. And yeah, the design space is kind of fluid in that sense. Um, we are also kind of like a B plus tree with models, except with these four core ideas thrown in as well. Right, mm -hmm. thanks.
Yep. I have one more question on this slide mm -hmm. um, about the logistics of modifying the tree. Do you have to retrain the model when you split or merge nodes or because you're just moving pointers around that isn't necessary? Mm, yeah, that's a great point as well. So as it turns out, in Alex, um, model retraining is kind of decoupled from structural modification. So kind of what that means is, you know, there's two reasons for modifying the structure. One, data nodes are full. So just physically, we have to modify it to create like you know, new nodes or larger gapped arrays. And the other reason is because, you know, models become inaccurate. So what we can do is whenever we split these nodes, we can just copy over the existing model. So for example, if we're doing like new expansion, then we simply copy over like a scaled version of the model that accounts for the fact that the gap array is now larger. If we do a split, then what we can do is also kind of logically like, you know, we have one linear regression model over some range of data. We've now split the nodes so that each, you know, half um, kind of uh, uh, gets one half of the initial range of data. So we can just logically split that linear model into two halves. And so we can keep the same models. Um, that's one choice. If the models are inaccurate, we can also choose to reorganize. So it's kind of like a separate decision of you know, whether to split nodes and whether to retrain. Got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, great. So. I think the last thing I said was that we have this, this kind of simple linear cost model to predict query runtime. So now whenever we make a decision about you know, how to modify the tree, we pick the, mod uh, the modification mechanism that will result you know, in the tree with maximum performance, at least maximum predicted performance. So this is a really nice setup because there's essentially no hand tuning from a user's perspective. Alex does you know, all this decision-making automatically based on our simple cost model. And another implication is that Alex is relatively robust to data and workload shifts. Because if a shift happens and the current Alex structure is no longer optimal for the new data and workload, then Alex should gradually automatically modify its tree structure to you know, gradually re-optimize for the new data and workload. Um, right. And uh, I think um, you know, through the questions that were asked, I think I, they, they covered everything else I was going to mention this slide as well. So in terms of results, uh, we compared Alex and Blue against um, a number of baselines, including the originally proposed RMI baseline index, a B plus tree, a model B plus tree, which I uh, described a, a while ago is basically we have a B plus tree, except we have a model in each node that helps guide the search. So we don't just do binary search in each, uh, in each node. And finally, we also compare against the adaptive radix tree or ART, which is an index that's optimized for data that's in memory, just like Alex. So we evaluate on four different data sets, namely longitude, long lat, log normal, and YCSB. And these data sets vary in terms of the complexity of modeling their CDFs. And then we have throughput on the y-axis, so higher is better. And on this read-only workload, um, depending on the data set, Alex can be up to 4x faster than a B plus tree and 2x faster than the originally proposed learn index. And then on a write heavy workload, which means a 50 50 split of point lookups and inserts, um, again, depending on the data set, Alex can be uh, up to two, two to three X faster than a B plus tree. So we've achieved Alex's design goals of having fast reads and also fast rates. Good question. Yes. Uh, do you know approximately how many levels you had in, in uh, the Alex tree? How de deep the tree was? The, allo the, sorry, the average depth, you know, averaged over keys, but I think very shallow usually between one and two. Got it. Yeah. So uh, probably this explains the performance advantage. Oh, sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, I, I'm just guessing that this might explain the, perfor the, the performance improvement. Yeah, it definitely explains um, part of the performance improvement. You know, part of it is traversal down the tree is much faster due to having fewer levels. And the whole thing is also more compact as I'll show in a bit. So that you know, saves on cache misses as well. But also, you know, search within a node is also more fast, it's also faster because of, you know, the core ideas of model-based inserts and exponential search. Right, so these plots show we have fast reads and fast writes, but arguably even more important um, is the fact that Alex also achieves smaller index size. So in this bottom row of plots, I'm showing index size on the y-axis, so lower is better. And for both the read-only and write-heavy workloads, um, again, depending on the data set, 
Alice can be ha can have up to three orders of magnitude um, less space for storing the index than indexes like the B plus tree in Art. So other nice results, which I, I won't show here, are that uh, Alice can bulk load rather efficiently. It can scale across data sizes, and it's also relatively robust to data and workload shift. Um, sorry, I just wanted to uh, quickly ask on the last slide. Yep. Um, so if uh, how can the model? Uh, why is the uh, size? If we look at the read only of the model B tree smaller than the normal B tree, aren't we just tacking on a model? Oh, that's a good point. So actually, for both the B tree and the model B tree, we actually kind of tuned the page size. Um, so I think on this read only workload, the B plus tree typically typically had smaller page sizes than the model B plus tree, which is why generally the model B plus tree, I see sometimes it's smaller, uh, but sometimes it's also larger because of storing all the models themselves. And also you know, depending on the data set, we tune the page size to different values. Um, but it's true. If the B plus tree and the model B plus tree always have the same page size, then you know, the B plus tree should be you know, a tiny bit smaller, uh, smaller than the model B plus tree because it doesn't store a model. Thank you. Great. And then just to summarize Alex, um, so Alex is this index structure that kind of combines the best qualities of both the B plus tree and the idea of learned indexes. So in particular, it supports not only point lookups um, and reads in general, but also writes like inserts, updates, and deletes. And at the same time, it's up to 4x faster and 2000x smaller than a B plus tree, you know, depending on the workload and the data set. So, and Alex achieves all these, you know, performance advantages through its four core ideas, which I copied on the right. So Alex is open source, you can find it on GitHub. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, there's a lot of current research going on to extend Alex to support things like string keys or more generally variable size keys, um, concurrency, and also work on data that's uh, persistent. And in particular, Kyle is pretty familiar with string keys because that's what he worked on as an intern this past summer at MSR. So I think given the time, um, I'll just skip over the section on multidimensional data, though it was just going to be a brief overview anyway. And I can send the slides if, if you're interested. Um, and I'll jump to talking about some of the future directions. So today I, I kind of introduced um, uh, a new project in the space of instance optimized database components, uh, specifically Alex, which is a learn index. And I guess. As I mentioned just a minute ago, we're currently working to support string keys, concurrency, and persistence. Um, and I didn't get to mention the multidimensional stuff, so you can ignore the, the final bullet point. But the broader point is that there's a lot of other research going on by colleagues and just others in the community on a lot of different instance optimized database components, some of which I briefly mentioned near the beginning of this presentation. And so it's a really exciting space. And the end goal is still to create kind of an end-to-end -end instance optimized database systems uh, that takes all these components and tries to combine them together. So we're trying to do this currently at MIT with our SageDB project. And the big question is just, you know, how do all these pieces fit together nicely? Now, there are some kind of general challenges for all research in this space, um, and I'll highlight two of them. So the premise of these, you know, instance optimized systems is to instance optimize or like self-adjust for the given data and workload, which means that these systems also need to be robust when the data and workload you know, change over time in real systems. So that's one challenge. And another challenge comes from the fact that a lot of these you know, early research works show a lot of really nice empirical results, but there is you know, still some work to be done in terms of showing theoretical analyses. So if you're interested in this stuff, um, the first link down here is the link of our group lab page where you can find you know, some descriptions of our recent research. And then we're also trying to start a blog. So at the moment, this blog is actually empty. Um, but for sure, over the, the next couple of months, we'll actually fill it up with some posts about our research. So please check it out if you're interested, and thanks for listening. All right, well, thank you so much for giving a talk, Jalen. I think, you know, obviously we're close to nine. If people want to ask, stay later and ask some questions, I don't know what your, your schedule is, if you have time around, Jalen. I'm available to stick around, yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is very interesting work. Thank you. Yeah, really cool stuff. Thanks, Alex. Unfortunately, we did not name the index after you. <laughs> so maybe one oh, thing- Oh, I am just a nice name overall, just, just objectively <laughs> speaking, right? So. That's true.
Okay. One thing we could also do, there's not really many questions. We could stop the recording so people don't have to uh, kind of uh, listen to our discussions, but we could also do kind of a round of introductions to make sure that everyone knows everyone, since, you know, this is not a super large group and this is an opportunity. Sure, I'll stop the recording now.